And welcome, Mel. So go ahead and introduce yourself and I'll give you the floor and let me know if you need anything. Sounds great. Thanks, Andrea. <clears throat> good afternoon, good evening to uh, those of our esteemed gathered guests here. I appreciate the uh, the next hour of your time to kind of go over some things that sound basic, but could be anything but. Um, real quick to think about uh, the slides, or not to think about, to, to address the slides that went out in the email earlier today. Um, as is a chronic problem with people like me who have a, a gnarly case of ADD and also the opportunity to put together slide decks. Uh, my set of slides have changed three times maybe four, um, since I gave those slides to Andrea uh, to, to send out. So if you do really wanna get a, a set of the slides, I can really clean them up and make them something that could be useful to somebody besides me. And uh, shoot me an email, uh, my email <clears throat> will be on this uh, last slide on the screen and you can shoot me a note and we can connect and I can help you out if you really gotta have my slides. Um, next thing is the Slides aren't advancing because of the Zoom. <laughs> um, the next 50 to 60 minutes of our time together are going to be spent talking about what happens in about 50 to 60 seconds of our interaction with a patient. So I just kind of want to kind of frame this entire conversation around the idea that this is an hour of talking about what happens in about the first minute of introducing ourselves to a, uh, a patient or, or even before we introduce ourselves, just, just getting eyes on them from maybe some distance away. So it seems nuts that we could talk for an hour about something that happens in a, in a, in a blink of an eye in many cases. So, but that's, that's what we're talking about. It's kind of fun. I get a kick out of talking about this. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to a good time as we go forward. So who am I? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Mel Oakley. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for coming to, to hear me uh, pontificate and carry on for a while. Uh, I currently serve as a rural EMS agency director in Nashville, uh, which is just north of Battle Creek and south of Ionia. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fun place if you're familiar with the movie, uh, Oh Brother, Where Out Thou? They are a geographical anomaly. They're two weeks from everywhere. We're not quite that bad. We're an hour of driving away from uh, really any, any, any interventional facility. So it's kind of a fun place to be a paramedic. Uh, that being said, I'm a, a critical care paramedic and an IC, and I work part-time as a firefighter for Caledonia Township. Uh, and then, because spare time doesn't get, actually exist, uh, I work as a healthcare simulation educator for the Michigan State University's College of Medicine Learning Assessment Center. And then, uh, above all that, or with all that, I work, uh, I, I founded the BDI team, which is a healthcare and public safety consultancy, uh, doing education and training. Um, I also serve on the Michigan Rural EMS Network's Board of Directors, as well as the Society of Michigan EMS IC's Board of Directors. Um, the picture I've got there is of me in a kayak, and the reason for that is, is part of how I get to talking about this in the first place tonight. I serve also on the Committee for Operational Medicine well, with the Wilderness Medical Society, and, and that takes me down some of the philosophy on, on why I like talking about assessment the way I'm going to talk about it tonight. Um, I really love the idea of wilderness medicine being low resource and having the ability to do much with little. And if that doesn't sound like EMS, I, I don't know who is sitting in front of me now because our, our, our charge is often to do uh, much with little. And I think it's really, it's really fun to think about the ability to assess our patients and garner just a ton of data with very little equipment. And, and in, in fact, I think uh, by the end of this time we spent together this evening, you'll see that you can do everything I'm, I'm suggesting we do this evening uh, with no equipment or with very little equipment. Uh, and then the last thing, and it's close to a disclosure, but uh, SAM Medical, I do a little bit of work with them uh, in, the, in the education sphere. Um, I don't really have any disclosures. I'm currently seeking some disclosures. So if anybody knows anybody who wants to pay me for some of the things I could do, um, I'd love to have some disclosures to offer next time I give this presentation, but currently I don't really have any. So let's get into assessment principles. <clears throat> We're trying to determine the patient acuity. The, the reason that we start our assessments off uh, at all is, is to start our patient, uh, determine the patient acuity, kind of how fast do I need to move? Do I need to step into this quickly or can I kind of move you know, at the pace that I'd like to move at? You know, I'm trying to change something on my screen here because it's all goofed up. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Zoom. Determine the need for critical interventions. You know, I'll, I'll back up and say this. Every intervention we do, every procedure we do, everything we do, including some of our assessments, really should be based off of assessment findings. Everything should be based from our assessments. Um, we should determine, obviously, what interventions may be necessary. Not must do right now, but like maybe, like ah, I might need to do that thing. You know, we need to anticipate what the patient's needs are going to be. We need to make sure that we have adjustment here. 
make sure we have the ability to, to kind of see into the future, get our crystal ball out, use a little bit of clinical gestalt, a little bit of future <laughs> fortune telling, if you will, and see into the future to go, I really think that airway is not going to hold, or hey, I really think that while they're, they're perfusing right now, they may not be uh, in a few minutes, and kind of think forward a little bit on that stuff. And then the last thing on here is just the communication with the next echelon of care. You know, it's really important for us to have something interesting to say when we when we meet new people. Um, so when we meet the next, you know, the next first the next responders, you know, if it's, if we're serving as a, a first responder capacity and we're having a transport platform come to see us, or if we are that transport platform and we're going to see our colleagues at the in, in hospital field, our in the hospital setting, it's really important for us to have interesting things to say. So it's. It's important for us to have a clear understanding of what's going on with our patient, even if it's not something we can change or, inter or inter intervene on behalf of. It's good for us to have a good, solid picture. And I think a lot of that stuff we can find pretty quickly. Also, looking for what I can fix. What can I not fix? You know, what can I find that I can't fix? Think about things like uh, bleeding inside that maybe I can't address that bleeding on the inside, but I have a pretty good idea it's there. Identifying that and being able to pass that along. Think about... Uh, for those of you advanced providers, think about like we've talked in, in ACLS or in PALS about the five H's and T's. Think about what that five H's and T's list is. That's a list of reversible causes of cardiac arrest. Well, why is it interesting to have reversible causes of cardiac arrest? Well, these are the things we can intervene on behalf of. You know, so things like decapitation, you won't find in a list of reversible causes of cardiac arrest. So we need to think about what we can do something about like hypovolemia, hypotension, hypo. Thermia, you know, so doing without. These are just kind of some, some ridiculous examples of, you know, what we should be looking for and how to find these things. This algorithm I stole from, I honestly can't remember who, it was one of the EMS texts that we have, and I thought it was nuts. And so I think that if, if you are at all like me, then you'll see this and go, oh, there's just so much there. It's such a busy thing and it doesn't, uh, maybe some of you out there are, are linear thinkers and really don't have ADD like the rest of us in EMS, but that I just, I couldn't take that. So we'll, we'll think about scene assessment. So when we talk about scene assessment, you think about what are we looking for? You know, we, we often, you know, scene safe, BSI. That's a noise. <laughs> um, scene safe, BSI. What's going on with our patient? How many patients do I have? You know, all that kind of stuff, just like National Registry taught us back in the day. First off the bat, how many patients do I have? What happened? Could it happen to me? You know, if we go back to this is a trauma patient, so just for a second, pretend it is a trauma patient. And this is going to be somebody who, uh, who at least for a moment in time here recently, the scene wasn't safe for at least that person. So what do we do with that? Uh, do we have what we need? You know, these are all kinds of things we can get. And I think of this as being the, the windshield assessment. This is all stuff I do through my windshield. Now, some of you on here, and I looked at the name, so I know some of you are from the ITLS days. You know, so if you, if you go back to the ITLS or BTLS, which is really what I meant, the BTLS days, uh, they had the, the windshield assessment. And I think that was a good name for it, but it got confused with looking at the patient's windshield. So if you think about like, I'm looking through my windshield at what's in front of me. And... Think about when is the best time to call for more resources. You know, so we'll, we'll put scene assessment into this for a second and we'll abandon scene assessment here shortly and talk about just patient assessment. But now I've assessed my scene. What do I do with that information? Well, I would argue that from the inside of whatever vehicle you drove to this party is probably the better place to start asking for the resources you actually want. So things like I want more rigs, I want rescue, maybe I want a helicopter, I want some more friends at this party because this is a big party and I could use some friends to come over and help us. You know, those kinds of things. Uh, if, if this being a rural population, generally speaking, I'd bet that where you work is like where I work, which is to say that the radio I can hold in my hand doesn't work nearly as well as the radio I've got bolted to the dashboard of my ambulance. So if I want to ask for help doing it in a quiet setting in the front of my ambulance, I can look at my partner or my partner, whichever, whichever side we're sitting on at the time and say, hey, we're going to do this versus that. That's a really good time to do those things. So when we're doing that from up there, um, that's a great time to kind of look out and see. And we can start to get some of our general impressions. We're going to get into that stuff here in just a second here. So the big question, really, when we start to talk about the patient is, is the patient sick or not sick? We'll get more into that uh, in just a minute here. So social distancing, I know we're all sick of hearing about it. But what I want you to think about is I could get some information. 
about my patient without being anywhere near them. I could be back quite a ways and still gather and garner a lot of the information I need to make a solid position or take a solid position on their general impression, if you will. So I, I, I can't remember where I got this picture. I've had it in my, my purview for a little while here, but I want to look at this picture for just a second. And if we, if you can forgive me for a second, the ADD will take over here and I'll point out there's no masks on these guys. So if you can think about for just a second, like how crazy this looks to us, which for most of us, it doesn't look that crazy, but our predis, our, our people who come behind us, you know, they're going to look at this and go, oh my goodness, they're walking into the room of somebody who's pretty sick and they're not even wearing a mask. Can you imagine such a time? Um, and some of us will remember a time when, when gloves were that same way. So this is kind of interesting and I thought it was, it was fun, but it really gives us a good, a good example of what it's like walking in and being able to see from some distance kind of what we're, what we're seeing here. So what are we looking for? Uh, are they sick? Are they breathing? Are they moving? All that stuff. We'll get to that in just a second here. So patient assessment. This I stole wholesale from PHTLS. I think they did a great job with it. This is the uh, X, A, B, C, D, E. Now that's great. And we'll get to that in just a second here. But this is what we're probably more familiar with, the ABCs. All right, so we got our airway, our breathing, our circulation. Great. If we're looking at a, a trauma patient or somebody who's been injured in any way, circulation is the last one on the list. And that means if they're bleeding at all, we sort of left that out in the cold. So let's look at this from the way the trauma, the trauma folks look at it. I think they did a pretty good job giving us a, a good framework to, to approach this from. So X, of course, in the way algorithms or uh, um, uh, mnemonics work, the X doesn't actually start with X. It's exsanguination or external hemorrhage, um, however you want to think about that. But it's really important, I think, to start off our, our approach to our patients with the are they bleeding? And, and if so, do I need to do anything about it? Uh, one of the things I tell all people, I, I, all my charges is uh, from the moment you arrive on scene, your patient really isn't allowed to bleed anymore. Uh, they probably shouldn't be seizing anymore. They should be breathing and you know things like that. There's a handful of things that really draw the line in the sand. Uh, bleeding control is certainly one of those things. They need to stop bleeding right after you get on scene. So looking for examination is, is the first step in, in, a, in a good patient assessment. Oh, and then do something about it for sure. And then obviously our airway. Now I like that airway comes after examination because one of the big purposes of the airway is to bring oxygen in to put it on the blood and to take CO2 off of the blood. And if the blood is running down the sidewalk, um, having a good airway doesn't do anybody any good really. So it's good to put the airway after examination. Now we're on airway, let's talk about airway. Is it patent currently? If not, what do I have to do to make it patent? Do I need a jaw thrust? Do I need to put an adjunct in? Do I need to uh, reposition the patient in some way? You know, not all these things are trauma patients after all. Sometimes we can just do like a, a tilt chin lift, maybe pat behind the shoulders. These are things we could, we could do for sure. Um, the other part is if it is patent currently, do I anticipate that we're gonna lose patency on that airway over, over any kind of period of time over in front of us here? So that's really one of the things to kind of dive into it is kind of that, like I said, the crystal ball and what does it look like going forward? Breathing, obviously. How are they breathing? Are they breathing? Is it interesting? Breathing should be boring. Breathing is boring. Think about the last time you thought about your breathing, except right now, because you're totally thinking about your breathing right now. But if you think about it, breathing ought to be boring. And if your breathing when I'm assessing you isn't boring, why that's, that's quite interesting, isn't it? So more on the breathing thing in a few minutes here, but uh, that, that comes next. Circulation, obviously we're gonna look at like, how's their circulation look? How's their skin look? How's their pulse rate? You know, what is their blood pressure? Things like that come into circulation. And then obviously if there's any other bleeding we didn't address yet, now's a really good time to do that. Give me one second. <clears throat> and then disability. So thinking about disability here, uh, what does disability mean? Disability really means what can't they do right now that they could do when they woke up this morning? So if they can't tell you their name right now, but they could when they woke up this morning, there's, there's a sign, you know, if they can't move their left arm right now and they couldn't move their left arm yesterday or for the last 10 years because they had a stroke 15 years ago and haven't been able to move their, arms, their left arm since then, it's not really a disability we're looking at from a uh, acute assessment perspective. So think about disability as both mental status and, and your neuro stuff. Uh, and then lastly, we have our E for expose. Now, I like that exposure also brings with it environment because whenever we expose our patient, we're exposing them for us to assess them visually. We're also exposing them to the environment. So if the environment is cold, we're exposing them to the cold of the environment, which as we know, hypothermia kills trauma patients and it's not good, it's not good for anybody anyways. Uh, see also those five H's and T's for before. It's one of the reversible causes of cardiac arrest. So hypothermia is not so cool. 
not so good. When we, we need to expose them, we need to look at them, but just remember that we need to uh, recover them when we're done. Now, many of you have seen this before. This is where I like to land when I talk about making a general impression or getting a, a good idea for how my patient's doing. And I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this right now. So this is the PAT or the Pediatric Assessment Triangle. And that's a great name for it, except it's pretty limiting. It's kind of narrow. So let's broaden it out. I call it the Human Assessment Triangle because I really don't care how old you are. I think there's a lot of value in this particular utility. So let's, let's run through it here. The skin is the first leg of the triangle. And then they said appearance when, you, when they did it for kids, said appearance. I really think activity is a much better way to look at this. And we'll dive into that a little more in a minute here. And then there's breathing. So skin, we're looking at the perfusion of the skin, the character of the skin, if you will, not the color as much as the character. Is there blood in the skin? Does that blood have oxygen on it? Is the blood moving around like it ought to be? Uh, work or breathing? How hard are they working to breathe? Is, it, is their breathing interesting or is that breathing boring? And, and if, if, it's not, if it's not boring, what's going on with that? We'll dive deep into each of these things as we go along here. And then under mental status, under activity, we're talking about mental status. That's really what we're looking for. Activity, appearance, these are mental status really is what we're diving into here. So we're gonna pick apart each one of these, these things here as we go along. So come along as we go. So sick or not sick, I've got to give a, a credit to Mr. Mike Helbach. He wrote a textbook on <laughs> sick or not sick. But I'll also lean back into uh, the way EPC, Emergency Pediatric Care, it's one of NAMT's programs, um, how they kind of talk about sick versus uh, sick and quick. So I think it's really good for us to look at our patients and kind of see how sick are they. And then also at the exact same time, kind of evaluate how long did it take to get to this current state? You know, is this the sort of thing that, have, that developed over weeks or is this thing that developed over minutes. You know, so for example, if 20 some odd minutes ago, this individual had all their blood volume inside their body. And right now they're, they're losing it at a rapid pace. That's one of those, let's move quick and change it kind of things. You know, whereas if they've got a, uh, a growth on their arm that's been developing over years, probably not anything we're going to, uh, to dive into and do something about right quick. Um, it's, it's important to kind of think about like, how long did it take for this thing to develop? That doesn't always equate to how quick we're going to, uh, to address it, but it can sort of help us guide what we do next and kind of what our next assessments are going to be you know chest pain that came on over weeks versus chest pain that came on over minutes these are these are things that kind of generally speaking will give us a bit of a different uh, uh, impression so more on this as we go along this will be kind of a recurring theme as, as we go here all right so this is this is one of the things that i like to think about and this is this is purely a melism okay so if this doesn't resonate with you it doesn't land then, then don't worry <laughs> you're not left out in the cold you're just not in the camp where i find myself so I think of, of, of the two brains of this human critter, all right? We think about the human brain and the mammal brain. Really, we're talking about like the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, all right? But the way I've heard it put better, really, is the triune brain. So what we have really is we have our, our reptilian brain, which is that mammal brain that I was referring to. That's the, let's maintain a blood pressure, let's keep breathing, let's keep having all the right stuff go on, right? That's all that automatic kind of stuff. And then we have our limbic system, which I'm not gonna address a whole lot right now. And then our neocortex, that's the speech, logic, higher thinking, recalling information that's important. So we think about the priorities of the, of the individual I'm interacting with in the, in the moment. So if I walk up to you and I go, hey, how are you? And you say, I'm not very good. And I go, all right, cool, what's going on? And you say, well, I just crashed my car. And I go, oh yeah, that's a, that's a bummer, isn't it? You go, yeah. It's a really expensive car, all right? These are human problems, all right? If the problem with the, the crashing of the car is, uh, you know, that, that the car was a lot of money and there's gonna be some, you know, some conversation with the bank and the insurance company about this, that's a more human problem. So what that means is that we've got uh, the, the, the mammalian or the, the reptilian side of the house is kind of taken care of at this point. You know, for, compare the contrast that to the, I walk up to you and I go, hey, what's going on? And you go, I crashed my car or my motorcycle or whatever. And I go, yeah, that's a bummer. Why, you know, that's, that's, that's not good. You go, yeah, and I'm losing quite a bit of blood. Oh yeah, sure. Are. You know, and, and you're, you're not, you know, speaking much because really if you're, you know, if you're the way I'm kind of envisioning you right now, you're not doing much, your, your activity level is quite low and you're not really, you're not handling things on the, on the human side of the house. You're really just just, you know, taking care of the reptilian side of things. You said, know, be like, I walk up to you, I kind of poke you, you groan at me a little bit. Your heart rate is fast. Your pulse rate is weak. Your pulse is weak. You know, these kinds of things. You're breathing not very well. Uh, that'd be the reptilian side of the house and then get what they want. 
this again will be kind of a recurring theme. I keep coming back to that stuff as we come along, but I wanted to, to anchor with kind of the human versus mammalian or, or reptilian side of things. I've, I've always called it human versus mammal. And then here a while back, I was uh, quite abruptly corrected that that's, that's reptilian, not mammalian. And, and so that's probably more correct. I'll try to do better in the future. All right, let's get into that, that PAT, that human assessment triangle. All right, so let's talk about activity. This is one of those ones that I think of as being really cool because I can see it from yonder. I don't have to be anywhere near you. I can be in my, in my truck looking through my windshield and see what it is you're doing, right? So I can look at this and say kind of, what are, they, what are they up to? You know, so this is the, are they upright? Are they moving with a purpose? Are they doing things? You know, to, to take a, you know, that car action example, I kind of keep coming back around to, you know, if I pull up on scene and they're, they're filing a claim on the smart app, on the phone, on the smart, on the app, on their smartphone, and, uh, and they're filing the claim and they're doing all the things and they're calling the wife to say, hey, I'm not going to be home on time and those kinds of things. Compare that to the patient who's prone. You know, so for example, if, uh, if, if we arrive on scene of, of a car accident, we'll say, because I keep coming back to that for some reason, and, and the, the driver of the car is no longer in the vehicle and by all appearances, they didn't get out on purpose. Uh, maybe they got out in a hurry all at once. And they're over yonder and they're in the mud or the snow or whatever it is over there. Um, and they're still prone. Kind of think about what that means to us. You know, what does it mean for us to arrive and find somebody prone? What does it even mean to be prone? Let's think about just from a comfort perspective, because I like to be comfortable. Let's think about how comfortable is it for us as humans to be prone someplace? Um, you know, coming off the tail end of, of last year's COVID thing, we heard a lot in medicine about proning. And uh, I can attest to you, that's very uncomfortable. You know, when I was in the hospital, they had me do the proning and my hands kept falling asleep. My chest kept hurting because, you know, sleeping on your hands is uncomfortable. Uh, probably that was doing it wrong, but prone is not comfortable. Furthermore, prone doesn't mean good things, right? So if you go to the dictionary, which is what I did, you can see that what prone means is, is having a tendency or inclination being likely often used in used with. I didn't find that terribly helpful. Maybe you don't either. So let's go with this. Prone really kind of means susceptible. So think about what that means. And if your patient is prone versus anything else, really, they are susceptible to whatever badness comes along. So if you go back to my triune brain or my human versus mammalian brain, think about how happy the mammal or the reptilian side of the house is if the patient is prone. They're not doing anything to try to protect themselves, to try to keep this organism alive. They're not trying to like defend themselves in any way. So if you think about finding somebody who's prone, they're susceptible to whatever, you know, they're prone to badness, they're prone to whatever comes up next. Um, and they can't really participate in defending themselves from whatever comes along, be it the weather or anything else for that matter. So really, if you find your patient prone, that means something. Um, and, and I think of this as being kind of a continuum from prone to upright and doing things on their own and kind of everywhere in the middle. So if you think about this as a continuum of where you found your patient uh, initially when you met them and how that applies to uh, how good or bad or sick or not sick they are, uh, that, that I think will be, will be pretty valuable. I often think of, of uh, uh, sick versus not sick as being that continuum with sick all the way on one side and, and not sick all the way on the other side and, and kind of every person that we meet kind of lands somewhere along the continuum. We'd like them to be closer to that sick, or that, I'm sorry, that not sick perspective over there. Um, but we kind of have to assess them to figure out where we're at with all those things. So we'll kind of move on from there. All right, so let's talk about mental status, because that's really what we're talking about when it comes to activities, mental status. What's going on between the years? That's what we'd like to know. So let's talk about it. We have Avpool. And obviously AVPU means they're either they're alert. You know, this is the, I walked up, you're looking back at me, I'm looking at you, maybe we're interacting, maybe you called for us in the first place. This is good stuff, really. You know, if they're, if they're alert to start off with, that's, that's fantastic. Maybe it takes some verbal stimuli to get them to interact. Maybe I gotta go, hey, dude, how you doing? Or something to that nature to go, hey, you know, let's, let's, let's get you alert. You know, this is the uh, loud verbal stuff. This isn't just like whispering in our ear, right? This is, this is making some noise. And then there's pain. Like we gotta do something. We kinda gotta bother you a little bit to get you to get you to interact. Now don't go coping people with sticks. I know this is a, a broad uh, audience here. Uh, so I'll, I'll say it because maybe maybe some of you need to hear it. I'm not advocating for the poking of people with a stick. It was just a cute picture. And I thought, thought it really captured what I was going for here. What I would advocate for is, is managing airways, honestly. So, uh, you know, when, when I was coming up through my career, we had uh, 
ammonia inhalants at some times, we had sternal rubs at some times. These things I think you all know are, these are gone. We don't do these things anymore. Um, they're not very uh, helpful ways to elicit a painful stimuli on the, on the patient. They will elicit a painful stimuli, but they don't really serve much purpose beyond that. And that's where I land on the idea of using a jaw thrust to, to manipulate the airway, actually open the airway. You know, this is the, the patient's unconscious. I don't think they're awake. I'm not even certain they're breathing yet. So I just, you do that little jaw thrust in there. Uh, if you do a jaw thrust correctly, it's incredibly uncomfortable. I think that's valuable. For those of you paying close attention, you'll notice that the picture here is not a terribly accurate representation of a jaw thrust either, uh, but it was what I had available to me. And it just occurred to me now that, that uh, almost all, everything about it is wrong, um, except the patient is, is fine. Um, this works pretty good. It's also, uh, it, it kind of checks two boxes at once. It tells me that uh, their airway is patent if I move the tongue out of the way, but also it tells me whether or not they will wake up to painful stimuli. So that works, I think, really, really well for us to determine uh, how responsive our patient actually is. So take that for what it's worth. And then beyond that, it's just unresponsive. If when I do that, they don't wake up and go, please, sir, stop that. It's uncomfortable. Well, then that's a finding, really, if they allow me to do a jaw thrust and they don't ask me to stop. So Let's dive into Glasgow Coma Scale for, for a few minutes. I think this is one of those misunderstood things in our profession. And I'd like to address this because we are talking about mental status right now. And really, I think that the, uh, the, the Glasgow Coma Scale is a pretty valuable tool for us to use. And I think it's mostly misused in our industry. Uh, I'm nothing if not critical of my own, my own profession. And I think that we've, we've kind of not used this one totally right uh, all along. So let's, let's discuss it for a few minutes, if, if you don't mind. Obviously, we start off with eyes. Four is great, one is not so awesome. This looks familiar, doesn't it? We just talked about this a minute ago with AVPU. This is exactly what we're talking about with AVPU. So really, if you're doing an AVPU, you've got the first third, really, of your Glasgow Coma Scale checked off. Just start recording it, all right? All right, down to verbal. We're gonna walk through this. I'm gonna get a little deep on this, so forgive me, but think about what it means to have oriented speech. So what that means is I ask you what color is, I guess the old white foot, you know, uh, I ask you, uh, you know, what day is it? <clears throat> and you tell me it's Wednesday. All right, great. So what did it take to do that really? It took me encoding some language, sending it through to you, you hearing it, decoding the language, determining what day of the week it is, then re-encoding some language and having some motor functions to turn that language into, into sound and send it back to me so I could hear it. And that sounds overstated, but, but bear with me if you would. Confused speech. Well, this means I ask you what day it is. And you, instead of saying it's Wednesday, you say it's Tuesday or Thursday or pick a day of the week. I really don't care which one it is except Wednesday. So now you've given me an incorrect answer. You're confused, but your body's still, you, your brain still decoded language, thought of an answer that makes sense. It's just not right. Re-encoded that language, did the motor thing, sent out sounds that we recognized as, as being close. Still pretty good. The brain is doing okay. You know, it's not great. It's you're wrong. You know, you're inaccurate. You're confused, as the as the words on the screen say. But you're still making words, which is is, is better. Inappropriate speech. And so how I ask you, what day is it? And you tell me, red. All right. You're still encoding language. You're not really even close to accurate, you're not even in the ballpark, but your brain is still encoding language, sending words out as sound. That's all working pretty well together. It's just not the right words. So this is, this is more concerned about what's going on between the ears of our patient, but really we're still making language. We're still communicating in language and we're making words. And that's a big change to the next one. So now we're not making, we're making sounds. We're not making words anymore. So now we're making incomprehensible sounds. Uh, we're, we ask you what day it is and you just moan back on us or moan back at us or you groan at us or you just, you're not making words at all. Um, and and I, this is a great time to remind us that what we're talking about is the best possible response we can get out of the individual. This isn't like they moan sometimes, but then other times I can get them to talk. If I can get them to talk, that's the best possible response. If all they can get out of them is I give them a little little stimuli and they groan back at me or I yell at him or ask him a question or go, hey, sir, can you wake up? And he just, Ugh. that's that's a big change from somebody who's making inappropriate words. And then obviously we slide into the, the unresponsive category here. So now this is a person who's no longer making sounds to you at all, which again is, is obviously much, much worse than somebody who's able to make noises, uh, at least on command making noises. 
So let's um, let's move on from verbal now to to motor. All right, motor here obeys commands. This one sounds pretty clear, right? I tell them to do a thing, they do a thing. Touch your finger to your nose. They touch their finger to their nose. Great. Take, put your finger out so I can poke your finger, get a blood sugar, or you know, hold your arm out so I can do a blood, a blood pressure. You know, whatever, I take out your wallet, I need your driver's license. You know, whatever thing we give them a command for, they follow that command, that works great. Localizes pain. So for them to localize pain, I want to think about what that means. First of all, we're going to come back to obey's commands here in a minute. We've got a little more to dig into on that one. But localize pain. So what that means is, is I do a thing to them. Maybe I'm poking their finger for that blood sugar. Maybe I'm putting a blood pressure cuff on their arm. And they reach over their other arm and they don't care for that so much. And they're, they're localizing it. They're able to identify with another limb what the stimuli is and do something about it. So what that means is the signal is going up in this case, the arm, going up the arm to the brain, the brain's going, hey, we don't care for that a whole lot. And sending another signal down to the other arm and going, hey, do something about that. Coordinated, getting rid of that, of that painful stimuli or that just that stimuli in general. <laughs> Apparently my pin shows up now. <clears throat> We're gonna put a pin in that, that obeys commands and comes back to that. Local, our withdraws pain. Let's talk about withdrawing from pain. This one is an entirely different uh, animal than localizing pain. So withdrawing from pain, what this is, is the stimuli goes up the arm, goes to your spinal cord, your spinal cord goes, eh, <laughs> sends a signal right back down to that same limb, and, and you have a, a reflex. So think about this from a uh, perspective of we're assessing your, your brain's functions here. Your brain's not functioning <laughs> terribly well. If the best we can muster, again, this is the best we can muster, the best we can find our patient performing at, if the best they can do is pulling back on our, uh, from, uh, from a stimuli. So that's important to recognize. Posturing, decorticate. What does decorticate do? All right, so decorticate is, if we go back to that, like the mammal, the reptilian side of things, it's trying to protect its vital organs. This is like a last ditch effort to kind of kind of keep some of the parts from getting tore up, right? So compare that to the cerebrate. And for the, the sake of credit for photos, I have no idea where this came from. These are things I found in a big pack of photos I had. I don't even know who took them. I'd love to give credit where credit's due, but I can't. Um, the cerebrate here, this is the, I'm providing no protection, no function, if you will, to my, to my vital organs. So when I do this, it's really bad. <laughs> Go from protecting my organs, not protecting my organs. This is uh, obviously worse off than we were when we were, when we were localizing pain or withdrawing from a painful stimuli. And then obviously we move on into unresponsive. All right, so stand by for a little bit of controversy here. All right, what's this tool, this, this utility called again? It's not the Glasgow compliance scale. It's not the Glasgow command scale. It's not the Glasgow do what I say scale. This is the Glasgow coma scale. This is a utility built for judging, if you will, the level of coma that an individual has, not really their ability to do what I say. So let's talk through this for a second. I'm going to tell you a story. See if the story sounds familiar to anybody else. <clears throat> it's a Friday night. I'm working in the city because that's where I used to work as, my, as a paramedic. I'm working in the city. Somebody's had a few too many cocktails. Uh, they slip, fall off a bar stool, whatever it is. And now I'm involved, myself, my partner, a handful of other responders. And we come, we pick them up and, and we put them on the, on the bed and we put the seatbelts across them. You know, obviously three, five, whatever it is, seatbelts. Back in the day, it was three. So three seatbelts. And there's that one that sits right across their chest. We get a few minutes into the drive, they reach up and unbuckle that seatbelt because they're intoxicated and they don't really want to have a seatbelt on. And I say to them, sir, I need you to, I need you to keep that seatbelt on. Uh, and they, and they, they unbuckle it again. And I rebuckle it and say, sir, I need you to keep the seatbelt on. And so a lot of my peers would say that this patient is not obeying commands. And so that's where I point to the idea that this isn't whether or not they'll follow my commands this is a, a tool to determine how much coma they have. And if their brain is remaining in control of their body and saying, yeah, I don't particularly care for the seatbelt on my chest, I'm intoxicated and don't really want to be tied down right now. And we look at them and go, hey, dude, I'm really sorry. Click it or ticket. It's Michigan. Got to do the thing. And they're like, yeah, I, I don't care. I don't really want to have a seatbelt on. Their brain is still in charge of their hands taking apart the seatbelt. They score a six. You know, when I was a younger paramedic, I would have given them a five flat out because they weren't doing what I said. And, you know, after all, I'm the para, I'm the para god and they got to you know, do what I say. I've got the cape and all that, you know. It's not about that. It's about whether or not their body is obeying commands from their brain. This is, after all, the Glasgow coma scale. So if we don't think they have a coma based on, on what we find with our assessment, then, then you know, they got to give them, give it to them. 
that's a duplicate slide, my apologies. All right, continuing along the theory of or the, the line of general impression, let's talk about skin. All right, so let's talk about what skin is. Skin is your largest organ. We know that skin is also uh, the second least important organ in your body. All right, so skin is uh, second only to the gut as far as perfusion uh, goes when the body's trying to compensate. So if we think about like maybe you're a quart or two low on blood and your body's going, yeah. Hey, skin, gut, we'll, uh, we'll catch you later. Um, that's, that's some of the early signs we can find for, for shock compensation. So this is where we talk about, uh, it is the easiest to organ to assess. So I can be over here and I can't really assess your heart or your lungs or your gut or even your pulse, but I can see your skin from some distance away. You might even say from COVID safe distance, I can see how your skin's doing. You know, so it is the largest organ, the easiest to assess and the second least important organ in the body. So if you think about the idea that your body, your skin can go for a really long time without any blood in it, that your, your, your adrenal gland, your brainstem, your, 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 you know, every part of your triune brain knows that. And it says, hey, you know, we're trying not to die right now. So let's just not put blood in the skin for a little while and we'll catch it up later on. Um, think about like we can put tourniquets on people for hours and hours and hours and have them be just fine. Orthopedic surgeries use tourniquets to keep blood out in a bloodless field for their, their procedures. It's, it's all good at that point. Um, give me an example of, of a skin perfusion uh, scenario here. So this picture from about eight years ago uh, is a Boston Marathon bombing. And I want you to focus on the dude in the wheelchair. Now this, this story, and if we had more time, I'd love to tell you the story of these individuals here in the picture. Uh, we just don't have the time right now, but I want you to look at the picture or the face of the gentleman in the picture here. He is missing a bunch of blood. That's evident to anybody who can see the picture. And what's going on in this picture is that this dude has uh, has, has taken the blood that was in his skin and said, yeah, no, not right now. Uh, we'll catch you. We'll catch you later. Uh, we're going to put that in the brain and in the, uh, in the heart and, and, and maybe not many places beyond that. But you look at the fact that dude's still, you know, he's still got some muscle tone. He's still in the game, uh, but he's missing a lot of blood. So how is the skin can, can go without blood? How do we do that? Well, we have our pre and post capillary sphincters. And so what happens is those kind of squeeze down and they say, uh, blood's gonna keep moving through here, but it's not gonna get to the, the capillary. So we can't really see the blood in the skin when we do this thing. Um, also when the pre and post capillary sphincters kind of clamp down on that, it, it squeezes some of the sweat out. That's kind of how we eat a little bit of our diaphoresis. That's, um, that's one of the things we'll look at there. So um, good to know, not, uh, not the end of the world, but it's, it's certainly something to think about. Let's dive into breathing now. Why do we breathe? You know, I mean, th think about it just for a second. Like, why do we breathe? Let's get rid of CO2. Okay. How do we breathe? Should have skipped ahead, sorry. How do we breathe? Well, we, we sense we got some CO2 that we could get rid of, send a signal down, diaphragm drops, thoracic cavity expands. Now we have more space, same amount of stuff. The air comes into the path of least resistance because we have low pressure inside our thoracic cavity. So air goes into the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance really ought to be the trachea. But at that moment, when air comes into the path of least resistance because we have that negative pressure in our thoracic cavity, what I want you to think about is how, what happens with blood at that moment. So if we're compensating for not having enough blood, if we're compensating for not having uh, enough uh, volume or cardiac output, then one of the things our body will do is it will start breathing faster. Are and deeper. So what we do is we start changing the pressure in the thoracic cavity more often to try to pull more blood up. And then looking at my slides here, the slide I want to show you for that is, is farther, farther ahead than I want it to be. So we'll put a pin in that for just a second and we'll talk about assessing people who are breathing. So when we talk about like work of breathing, <clears throat> if you look at the picture of the gentleman on the left who's in a, a, a flat out tripod, you know, classic tripod position. And you look at his, his ribs and his neck, and this man is using every bit of his body to breathe. So you talk about work of breathing, you know, whether it's, whether it's shock, whether it's, it's you know, uh, a respiratory disorder, whatever it is it's got, this guy's got going on, he's flat out no good at breathing. And he's working his tail off to get every single breath he's pulling in. 
if you look at the guy in the middle there, um, that's a graphic that's kind of trying to talk about uh, pursh lip breathing and kind of how we how we cope with some of our respiratory disorders. So he's breathing in for a, a short count. So our I to E ratios, if you prefer, uh, we have a, a one to two here, um, but he's exhaling against pursed lips. He's trying to create more pressure in his, in his alveoli to keep the, keep the air uh, in and get the gas exchange to happen. Th this gentleman, uh, really all, uh, the, at least the two here, they're working hard to breathe on account of a respiratory disorder, less so probably uh, from a, a pulmonary, a, a, a perfusion standpoint or a blood flow standpoint. And the last guy in the end there, um, this is this is one of those those pictures really resonated with me because I seem to have found a lot of patients I've interacted with over the years who are no good at breathing. Uh, they were like me. They're no good at standing still. They don't want to just sit down and not be able to breathe. They want to be up. And so while I do find quite a few who are sitting down with hands on knees as a classic tripod, the standing up on the back of a, a back of a chair with their arms kind of doing the tripod or doing the, uh, the the table or the countertop couches, whatever, standing up and holding, holding their, their thoracic cavity open more to try to create more space for more air to come in because they're trying to make the gas exchange happen. And then no conversation here would be complete without talking about kids, right? So we got to talk about, about kid breathing assessments. So look at this, we got our, our baby all the way on the left and that kid's got uh, nasal flaring. So we're trying to get more airflow through that. Um, I'm gonna skip the girl in the middle for just a hot second. And I'm gonna point out to you the ribs on the kid all the way on the right side there. Look at those retractions he's got. That kid is, is working his tail off or their tail off to, to make the air happen. You know, so we, we talk about like breathing is, is really is ventilating here. So when we talk about ventilating, we're changing pressures. We're trying to change pressures. I said air should come in through the path of least resistance. In this case, this kid's trachea may not be the path of least resistance. It's trying to come in through other places too, which kind of tells you that there's something not, entirely right going on uh, um, with this kiddo here. So that's kind of terrifying, honestly. And then this young lady in the middle here, you know, we talk about like activity, which is one of the legs of the triangle we're talking about here. We talk about activity. What are they doing? Well, what is she doing? She's breathing. What else is she doing? Nothing. You know, the kids are curious, right? Kids should be looking around and going, hey, oh, hey, there's a, a fire engine pulling up or hey, there's an ambulance pulling up and this is exciting and what's going on and be involved in, in that. And this, this young lady here is a little bit tripoded, not, not really, but mostly she's just breathing, not accomplishing anything else, but just, just breathing. All right. And now back to the, the blood flow thing that I wanted to talk about. So here's, here's an image of some of your great vessels. And what I want you to think about is the diaphragm drops down, thoracic cavity expands, negative pressure in the thoracic cavity, pulls blood up through the inferior vena cava. So that black line I shot there is a uh, poorly drawn, sorry, uh, poorly drawn diaphragm. And there's, your, there's, you know, to talk about your IVC, that's your inferior vena cava, that's where the blood comes from. All right. So we talk about uh, pulling blood up. Think about the fact that human beings are generally bipedal and we, we stand up on our own. And then if I need some more flow, if I want some more um, cardiac output, then I need to have more cardiac input. So if, I, if I'm having trouble making the blood flow move around and around, um, I need to get more in. And so one of the things we'll do is we'll increase our thoracic uh, pump, if you will, our bellows and pull more blood in and present it as an offering to our right atrium and go here, pump this around too, would you? And so if you think about, and this is important, I think, to think about, one of the first things you'll find with individuals who are compensating for trouble, specifically kids, is that ventilatory rate will go right up as, as an early sign of I'm trying to, to stay alive here. Um, you look at, um, you know, you get the increased ventilatory rate, which is not only trying to exchange some more gas, but it's also trying to move some more blood. And then you get your skin that kind of starts to have the effects we talked about earlier. Um, in that order, it's, it's important to think about that. Um, no conversation about this, and I'll go back here to the kids because we got to talk about kids here. How would we know if we have a fast heart, I'm sorry, resp ventilatory rate on a kid? Well, we have to be able to measure the kid's ventilatory rate in the first place. You'll need a watch of some kind and the ability to, to measure them. But this is where I, I think we all need to remember that um, kids of different ages have different uh, expected vital signs. And so uh, no conversation about assessment would be uh, complete without talking about, um, we do need to know how long the kid weighs or actually how long they weigh. So a Braslow tape or some kind of a, a length-based weight measuring predicting device. And then uh, this is Michigan. So get your, your MyMedic cards out. And on the MyMedic cards, I believe it's at the top now, uh, it'll tell you what their anticipated ventilatory rate ought to be. And that's how you can identify that this kid is breathing more often than they ought to. So here on the screen now, we have some visual uh, representations of, of badness, um, but also you can use some uh, 
some of the resources you have available to you for um, uh, reference wise to identify kind of who's breathing harder than they ought to be. So we talked about a couple of things with compensation there. I want to just kind of right into uh, the, the kind of the closing of this as we, as we kind of wrap up here. Um, we compensate by attempting to move more blood into the thoracic cavity to offer it up to the right atrium. We compensate by breathing more to change the gases more. We compensate by perfusing different parts of our skin and our brain. And then our mental status kind of gives us an idea of like, how are they doing? You know, I, I forgot to mention it earlier, but one of the questions I'll ask about uh, my mental status is when I'm talking to my, my, my patients, I'll ask them, hey, how many dimes are in a buck 50? You know, and if they're of the right age, they should understand how much a dime is, which at this point means over 30, I think. Um, you know, they'll tell you it's 15 dimes in a buck 50. Um, that involves knowing how much a dime is worth, how much a buck 50 is worth, doing some math. Pay patients who can answer that question, hey, you're probably doing pretty okay. All right, so let's land this plane, shall we? Uh, we talk about general impression. You should form a general impression and that general impression should be formed pretty quick and maybe from some distance, um, kind of before you can smell them, if you will, uh, before you can get close enough to be in danger of catching COVID from them. Uh, we need to determine if they're sick or not sick. We, we need to know. Um, and then are they compensating? And if they're compensating, how are they compensating? And I didn't put it on here, but not just how, but from what are they compensating? GCS usage, we need to use it correctly. It's, it's super important for us to, to know how to do it. It's very, very easy. It requires no equipment, which is the next point on here. Um, but GCS is one of the things we need to use correctly. Um, no equipment needed for almost anything I've talked about so far in the last hour of being together here. And one thing I can't stress and, and state this over, uh, st state this enough is this is not level dependent. There's not a single thing I talked about this afternoon that is a paramedic or an MFR or EMT or nurse or physician or you know, podiatrist or whatever, whatever you need to, whatever level. It doesn't not matter who you are. Everything we've talked about, you can do. And generally speaking, most of what we've talked about here tonight can, can happen in about 50 to 60 seconds instead of 50 to 60 minutes. So that is almost to a minute, 50 minutes. And I wanted to, to leave a few minutes at the end for us to, to answer any questions that came up or kind of address anything. So I'll leave you with this. There's my contact information. Uh, I do wanna leave some time for some questions, but I just wanna leave you with this. If you're signing off now, stay safe, take care of each other. It's a hell of a world out there and uh, God bless you for doing what you do. So I'll take any questions you have now. And the floor is open for questions. So don't be shy. Yeah, it was an excellent presentation. Well, Thanks. while we are waiting for questions, um, oh, talk about capillary refill. Is it useful? Yes, sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, so if, if, if the patient is warm enough to have it be a reliable tool, absolutely. If the patient is, is well enough, you know, uh, overall general health, you know, if they've got, you know, the COPD with the emphysema, the club fingers and all that kind of, if, they're, if it's, you, you really need to have uh, kind of the right patient for that. I think, you know, when we talk about tools in the toolbox, it's one of those tools, it's, you don't need to carry, it's, it, it's a tool you carry between your ears. So it's, it's very, very light. Um, so yeah, check it. If it's, if it's delayed, start looking at reasons it might be delayed. If the patient's cold, if they're, you know, uh, if they're outside in the winter, or if, if they've, if they're shunting for some reason other than, than compensation, it may not, may not be too, too valuable. Um, I think it's still valuable. To, I think it's still worth doing is, is what I mean to say. It's still probably worth doing. Um, I wouldn't hang my hat on it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't jump off a bridge because it was abnormal. Um, but it's certainly a tool in the toolbox and I think it's not worth tossing out. Very good, thank you. So as we're just waiting for other questions, I wanted to really quickly announce our next webinar is going to be August 25th. We are bringing back maternal 911. Um, we're gonna do something a little different. It might invi involve some live film. So that'll be interesting. So you can tune in just to watch us uh, have some bloopers because I think that will happen. Um, but we are working on that project now. And I think August webinar is going to be very different in a really good way. So if you need an OB credit, it's OB medical, I believe. Um, it's gonna be one and a half, 90 minutes. And there'll be some interesting things going on there. So I, I definitely recommend tuning into that one. Registration is open. Um, once we stop recording, also, I will put the link to the quiz in the chat box. 
please remember that email has the quiz uh, link as well. So you can find it there. Um, so there are two spots you can get that link uh, to do your quiz and eval for your CE. So I see a lot of positive comments here. I don't see any other questions yet. Um, is there anything in the quiz that you can recall that you wanted to touch on quickly? Um, or anything you want to highlight to make their, their quizzing a little bit more pleasant? I am going to stop recording.